Welcome to Introduction to Personal Computers, brought to you by ComputerLearningZone.com. I'm your instructor, Richard Rost. This course is for the absolute beginner who has little to no experience with personal computers. That's right, I don't assume you know anything about computers. I know in today's day and age, it's rare to find someone who's never used a computer before, but I know you're out there. I know you need help and have lots of questions about what many other people consider to be common knowledge. But you're not alone. This course is for you. For the rest of you, please feel free to share this course with anyone you think might need it. You know who I'm talking about. The coworker who's constantly asking you PC questions. The neighbor next door who always needs help with his computer. Or even your mom and dad who can't figure out how to use the keyboard and mouse properly. Those are the people this course is for. So even though you might not need it, keep it in mind for someone else who does. There are no prerequisites for today's class. If you've never used a computer before, you'll be absolutely fine. Today's class is going to focus on the basics of computer technology. We'll learn some helpful definitions. We'll discuss computer hardware in detail, including system components, peripherals, data storage, and more. We'll learn all about how to use the keyboard and mouse and what a lot of those crazy keys on the keyboard are. And finally, we'll talk about ergonomics, things to watch out for, and tips for beginners. My next class, which is Microsoft Windows Beginner Level 1, will cover more of the software aspect of computers. Throughout my Windows series, we'll learn more about basic software applications using the internet, file management, security, privacy, all that kind of stuff. But today's class is for the computer beginners who need the absolute basics. So who am I? Why should you learn from me? And why should you listen to my advice? Let me share my background real quick. I began using computers at the age of eight in 1980, so you can do the math. I have a long history with technology. I attended university right after high school for computer science, but I dropped out. I got bored. I started my first business in 1992, providing PC sales, service, networking, and custom software development. My customers were constantly asking where they could go to learn how to use the computers I just sold them, so I decided to open my own in-person computer training center in 1997. I ran the training center for a few years before transitioning to online training. With more and more people getting high-speed internet, I could record videos and reach a much broader audience. I've been dedicated to online training since 2002. In 2010, I was approached by a book agent who found my Excel lessons on YouTube, leading to the publication of The Complete Idiot's Guide to Excel 2010. I received the Microsoft MVP Award for Microsoft Access, which is my personal specialty, in 2013, 14, and again in 2023. So that's it. That's a brief overview of my professional background. As you can see, I've got over 30 years of experience as a computer professional and I've been teaching software applications for most of that time. So if you need to learn how to use a computer, I'm your guy. Oh, plus, I'm all about having fun. I do my best to keep my videos light and entertaining. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Now, before we get started with lesson one, if you have any questions regarding the material covered in today's class, and you're watching this course on my website, just scroll down to the bottom of the page that you're on and post your questions there. I've got a fantastic group of volunteer moderators who love answering questions from students just like you. And also take a minute to read through any other questions that have been posted as your question may have already been answered. Also make sure you click on that red subscribe button to get notified of any other questions or comments posted for this class. If you're watching this video on YouTube, you can still post your questions and comments. Just scroll down to the comments section. I don't check YouTube as often as I check the comments on my own site, but I do try my best to read and respond to them as often as I can. Now let's take a closer look at exactly what's covered in today's class. In lesson one, we're going to learn about computer hardware. First, we're going to discuss why you should learn this stuff. Why should you learn about computer hardware? You're just going to turn the computer on. It works, right? Why do you have to learn about what's inside it? We'll talk about that first. We'll go over some basic definitions. We'll talk about PC versus Mac, and then we'll talk about the different system components that are inside your computer. In lesson two, we are continuing to learn about computer hardware. We're going to talk about data storage, peripherals, and power protection. 
In lesson three, we're going to talk about using the keyboard. We'll learn about what all the different keys on the keyboard are and those little lights, and we'll learn how to use most of them. In lesson four, we're going to talk about using the mouse. Lesson five is something I call Rick's tips. Now, I was going to call it Richard's tips because I, I do go by Richard professionally, even though my friends and family call me Rick. You can call me Rick if you want. Um, but Rick's tips sounded better than Richard's tips. So we're going to go with Rick's tips. Okay. We're going to talk about ergonomics, computer caveats, things you got to watch out for, and tips for noobs. Yes, new computer users are called noobs. It's a term of endearment. We don't mean any insult by it. And that's what we're going to talk about in lesson five. In lesson one, we're going to learn about computer hardware. First, we're going to discuss why you should learn this stuff. Why should you learn about computer hardware? You're just going to turn the computer on. It works, right? Why do you have to learn about what's inside it? We'll talk about that first. We'll go over some basic definitions. We'll talk about PC versus Mac. And then we'll talk about the different system components that are inside your computer. Okay, computer hardware. Why learn about this stuff? You turn the computer on and it works, right? Well, sometimes knowing what's under the hood can be very helpful. First off, if you're considering buying a new computer, you're going to invest hundreds, maybe thousands of dollars in a new system, it's beneficial to know what you're buying. This is particularly helpful if you're shopping at one of those mega computer stores where the salesperson might be more focused on their commission than trying to sell you exactly what you need, right? They're trying to give you the greatest products, the biggest and best, and they don't know what your needs are. So knowing about computer hardware equips you with the information you need to make an informed decision on what to buy. Having your PC serviced. Now, when I drop my car off at the local service center or the dealer and the technician tells me that such and such is wrong, I've got to take his word for it. I know nothing about cars. But you shouldn't find yourself in the same position with computers. Computers are a whole lot easier to learn than cars, at least for me. So with a little bit of knowledge about what's going on under the hood of your computer, you can make more informed decisions about its service and maintenance. Calling for support. I used to work in the tech support industry. I used to be one of those guys on the phones way, way, way back when I was a kid, right? And I know that sometimes phone technicians can unintentionally make callers feel inadequate, like they don't know what they're talking about, even with basic technical terms. So it's essential to have some understanding of the fundamentals of computer terminology to communicate effectively with support staff, even just to let them know that you kind of know what you're talking about. This can help ensure that you get the assistance you need without feeling overwhelmed or patronized. I know calling for tech support can sometimes be intimidating, and some people put it off because they just don't understand the person talking to them on the phone. Talking to coworkers and friends, or your kids, right? Whether a coworker in the next office asks you for a thumb drive or a friend mentions a particular piece of software, knowing what they're referring to helps in everyday communication. It helps you to feel digitally literate in today's interconnected world. And finally, and most importantly, computers are fun, right? This stuff's fun to learn. I enjoy this stuff. I love this stuff. So... Even if I wasn't teaching this stuff, I used to love just learning new things all the time. Computers, science, all that good stuff. So it's something new to learn. Okay, now before we get into the hardware, let's go over some basic computer definitions. First, what is a computer? Well, Webster's defines a computer as a programmable, usually electronic, yeah, they can be mechanical, device that can store, retrieve, and process data. While there are more elaborate and specific definitions for the word computer, Webster's definition just about sums it up. A computer is a machine that knows how to do one thing, manipulate data. All the computer really understands is a series of electrical impulses representing numbers, zero and one, on and off, right? But because it can process those ones and zeros so fast, billions of operations per second, right? Like Carl Sagan used to say, billions and billions. 
Well, since it can do those things so fast, it can do all kinds of wonderful things. It can play a game or edit a spreadsheet or you can play stupid cat videos, right? All of those things are made up of ones and zeros. Now, computers today come in all shapes and sizes from tablets and laptops to desktop PCs to big rooms with servers on racks. These are all different types of computers. Hardware versus software. Essentially, if you can touch it, it's hardware. That's the general rule. Now, today we're going to learn a lot about different kinds of computer hardware like motherboards, memory chips, video cards, processors, all those things. That's all computer hardware. They're physical objects you can touch. Now, software, on the other hand, represents computer programs like Microsoft Excel, Word, games like Solitaire, even Microsoft Windows itself. Those are usually applications that run on the computer hardware. Now, CDs, for example, if you remember those, the actual CDs themselves are considered hardware because you can touch them, right? But the software on the CD, the program on the CD, is considered software. The binary system. Now, a few minutes ago, I mentioned that the computer only knows ones and zeros, right? Now, those ones and zeros make up something called the binary system, which is the language inside the computer. And I like to take a moment to cover this with my beginner students because lots of people don't know what the terms megabyte, gigabyte, terabyte, all these things mean. And it's kind of important to know because if you're going to go to the store and buy some memory or a hard drive, you've, you've got to know what these sizes are. Now, they're real simple. It's just how we measure the size of capacities in computer jargon. All right, so binary numbers are represented inside the computer as a series of ones and zeros like this guy right here, right? That is the letter A, the capital letter A, represented by 01000001, which is 65 in decimal. Do you need to remember this? Absolutely not. I'm just trying to give you a feel for how computers store information internally. Now, each one of those ones and zeros internally is called a bit, right? One bit is either a zero or a one. And you can put eight of them together to create something called a byte. So a byte basically represents one character of plain text, an A, a Z, an exclamation point, those kinds of things. Now, this is where the other terms come in. You take byte and you put a Greek prefix in front of it, right? Kilobyte is roughly a thousand, right? Kilo is a thousand, roughly a thousand bytes. Megabyte is million, right? Million bytes. Giga is billion bytes and Tera is trillion bytes. OK, and yeah, the computer scientists are nerds. We didn't like to make it an even thousand. It's because we want it to be a perfect power of two since everything's two characters. So, there's a long story as to why it's 1024. But essentially, you can think of it as a thousand. Now, what kinds of things can you store in each of these sizes? Well, a kilobyte is about the size of a short paragraph of text, right? About a thousand characters, not a whole lot by today's standards. A megabyte is about the size of a high-resolution photo. You take a photo with your camera, right? That's about a megabyte. A gigabyte is about an hour of video, right? And a terabyte's huge, all right? Terabytes are, are, are pretty big. All right, now that we're through those basic definitions, let's talk about computer hardware. Now, in the computer world, there are generally two types of computers that you'll find in most businesses and homes. There are PCs and Max. PC stands for personal computer, and there are a lot of different terms that define what a PC is. Sometimes you'll hear them called IBM personal computers or IBM PC clones, or sometimes you'll hear them called Microsoft PCs or Windows PCs. But generally, PCs run operating systems from Microsoft, such as Microsoft Windows. Now, Max, on the other hand, is another popular type of computer you'll find in a lot of homes and businesses. Macintosh computers, or Macs for short, are made by a company called Apple. Macs are very popular in the education, desktop publishing, and graphics arts industries. And PCs generally run the rest of the business world. Now, I am not a Mac user. I haven't touched a Mac since high school in the 1980s, and I don't plan to anytime soon. I could make another whole video as to why I don't like Macs, but that's, again, a topic for another video. Needless to say, I will be focusing on PCs for the remainder of this course and most of my courses. 
Speaking of PC versus Mac, you guys remember those commercials with the two guys from years ago? One would say, I'm a PC, and the other said, I'm a Mac. Right? These guys? Well, Apple used to try to paint PCs as boring and just for business. And back in those days, Macs were a lot better at graphics. They were cool. They were stylish. They came in different colors. But we've come a long way since then, and today PCs can do pretty much anything a Mac can do. So can you tell I'm not an Apple fan? <laughs> Okay, next up, let's discuss some of the core computer system components. The CPU, or the central processing unit, is basically the brains of the computer, responsible for performing all of the computational tasks, well, most of them. The CPU is typically a small chip mounted on the motherboard, which is a big circuit board inside the computer. Now, you may hear some people refer to the whole computer box or the tower itself as the CPU, but technically, the CPU is a small chip inside of it. The performance of a CPU is measured in clock speed, which represents the number of cycles per second that the CPU can execute. In the past, CPUs were rated in megahertz, representing millions of cycles per second. However, today, CPUs have much higher clock speeds, and you'll commonly see them measured in gigahertz, GHZ representing billions of cycles per second. Remember those Greek numbers from before, right? Mega, giga. You're going to see that a lot in computer terms. Now, the average for most computers sold today, it's 2023, is between 2 and 4 gigahertz. The faster the processor, the faster the PC will operate. Usually, there are other factors, but the CPU makes up most of it. Today, there are two primary CPU manufacturers that you'll hear of for personal computers. There's Intel and AMD. Both Intel and AMD CPUs feature multiple cores, allowing them to execute multiple tasks simultaneously and enhance overall system performance. You've heard of multitasking. Well, that's what that means. They can take multiple executions and split them up and execute them at the same time. As I mentioned a moment ago, a lot of the times you'll hear people mistakenly refer to the CPU as the whole machine when they actually mean the case or the chassis, it's sometimes called. The CPU is that tiny processor inside the machine that's responsible for executing instructions. As far as cases go, they come in various shapes and sizes. You've got full tower, mid tower, mini tower, desktop, slim desktop, so many different styles and sizes of cases. Now, I personally prefer laptops. It's been a while since I bought a desktop PC or a tower. Uh, for most offices, desktop PCs are the more cost-effective choice. Or if you're a gaming enthusiast and you're looking to customize your PC with high-performance components, a tower is typically the way to go. But for me, I've been a laptop user for the last couple of years myself, so that's my choice. Speaking of the case... If you do happen to open it up and poke around inside, or if you try to upgrade it yourself, you'll see this component, that's the power supply. Now it's essential to not try to open up this guy. It does have little screws on it, don't open it. This thing is not designed for servicing by regular people. Only electricians and individual with special knowledge of computer stuff should handle these things, okay? You can replace the whole thing, but don't open up that box. Even if the computer itself is unplugged, this power supply can still give you an electric shock. Trust me, I found this out the hard way years ago. There's a capacitor in there that stores some charge even when the machine is unplugged. So be very, very careful when working with the power supply or any internal components of the computer. Next up is memory. Now there's random access memory which is the amount of memory the computer has, and that represents how much information the computer can work with at any given time. RAM today is measured in gigabytes. RAM is erased when the power goes off. So if you unplug the computer, whatever's in the memory is gone. If you're writing a letter to mom in Microsoft Word, that letter is generally stored in RAM or the system's memory while you're working on it. So if you turn the computer off without saving your letter, We'll talk about where you save it in just a minute. Then you're going to lose it. Most computers sold today have between 8 and 16 gigabytes of RAM. Now, you want to be able to save that letter to mom so you can retrieve it later, right? You can finish it tomorrow, print it out, whatever. That's what your hard drive is for. 
Now the hard drive represents the storage space for your computer. Hard drives today are measured in gigabytes or terabytes, and they are permanent storage for all your documents, your Word documents, your Excel spreadsheets, your PowerPoint presentations, whatever videos you've got, all that stuff gets stored on your hard drive. In fact, your operating system itself, Microsoft Windows, is stored on your hard drive. So are the programs. Microsoft Word, Excel, all the programs are loaded onto your hard drive. Generally, hard drives are inside your computer, but you may also see external hard drives as well. There are also two common types of hard drive. The classic kind of hard drive that includes an actual spinning disk inside of it, kind of like a record player, as opposed to the new SSDs or solid state drives that have no moving parts and store everything electronically. These are much faster, but still a lot more expensive than traditional drives. And some PCs come with both. Solid state drives are a lot faster than the traditional hard drives. So you'll see some machines come now with a, a smaller solid state drive for things you use a lot, and then a bigger old school hard drive where you can store you know, all your old backups and your documents and your, your Star Trek photos and all those things, right? <laughs> Speaking of hard drives, if you do decide to open up your computer to explore around or upgrade or whatever, do not use any magnetic screwdrivers. I learned this the hard way too. Inside a traditional hard drive, there's a spinning platter with magnetic material on it. If you bring a magnet too close, you could potentially erase or corrupt some or all of the data on that drive. So keep that in mind. I know it's tempting to use a magnetic screwdriver to hold the, the screw on the tip of the driver to get in a little tight space. But trust me, it's better to avoid it and prevent data loss or damage to your hard drive. I know most of you watching this video aren't going to try to upgrade your computer at home yourself. But in case you do, I'm giving you these tips. Don't touch the power supplies, internals, and don't use magnetic screwdrivers. I got some more tips coming up too. When I used to work in PC tech support, I had so many people that thought that they could upgrade their computer themselves easily and they like did all kinds of nasty things. So that's why I'm just mentioning this stuff. Now, a lot of people have trouble understanding the difference between RAM memory and hard drive space. They may use these terms interchangeably and they're really quite different things. So I like to use the analogy of a desk to illustrate RAM versus hard drive. Remember RAM, which I will call memory, is the amount of information that the computer can work with at any one given moment. That's the stuff in the computer's brain. So if you think of the computer as a desk, then memory would be the top of the desk, the surface of the desk, the things that you can actually see what's going on right now. RAM represents the files you can have open that you can work with at any given moment. You can see them spread out on the desktop in front of you, not like clumped up together like that picture I just got there. <laughs> in fact, I stole some of these old pictures when I first did this class. I did an intro to PCs class way back in like 2002. This was my Windows 101 class. And I, uh, I borrowed some of my older photos. That's why they're so low resolution and grainy. So bear with me. Bear with me. I'm, I'm recycling. <laughs> now... The more files you open, the more stuff you're working with, the more memory that you use. And eventually you're gonna run out of memory and Windows may even tell you, hey, you're out of memory. Well, older versions of Windows usually will. Newer versions do something where they swap memory out to the hard drive, but that's a, don't think of that for this example, okay? That's more advanced. Basically, eventually, simply, you're gonna run out of memory, okay? So we have to close some of those documents down, close some programs that you're running, and what we can do is essentially save those programs from memory to the computer storage or the hard drive. So you got all these different Word documents open, right? You got a spreadsheet open, you got a presentation open. You can save that stuff from memory to the hard drive. So we take those files, we open up a drawer, and we put them on the hard drive. Essentially, we close the documents that frees up the system's memory so it can do other things now. And now if we want to go work with one of those files again, let's say we want to write a letter to mom, we now have more space available in our systems memory so we can open up those files again and bring them from the hard drive back up into the systems memory where we can work on them. And the original file is still saved on the hard drive, so we can always go back to it. All right, so that's the difference between RAM or memory and hard drive space. I used to talk to so many people that were like, I need to upgrade my system's hard drive and they, they really meant memory and, and, or vice versa. You know, I need, more, I need more room in my computer to store stuff. 
And so they're thinking they got to buy memory. What they really need is a bigger or a second hard drive. So it's understand it's it's important to understand the difference between these two things. All right, continuing on with our parade of hardware components, we've got the motherboard or the system board. Now, most of your other components, the hard drive, the processor, the memory, all those things, they're going to connect to the motherboard or the system board. It's essentially a big circuit board inside the computer that all of the other components plug into. This is basically the backbone of the computer. Now, in addition to those other components we talked about, you may or may not have expansion cards in your computer. Now, back in the day when I started building computers in the early 90s professionally, in the late 80s on my own, um, you would get your motherboard and then you'd plug all these other components into it. And you'd have to have expansion cards for things like a video, audio, uh, your network card, a modem if you wanted to connect to the internet over a telephone line. Remember those days? Nowadays, for most average computers, business computers, a lot of these functions are built directly onto the motherboard. So you don't need an additional video card, network card, audio, all that stuff. It's, it's built right in. So generally, the only people that buy these expansion cards now are people that want high-end systems. For graphics use, gamers do this. They'll buy like a, a really high-end video card. So their video games play really fast, that kind of stuff. Musicians might buy updated audio cards. Okay, but nowadays, most of this stuff is integrated directly into the motherboard. In lesson two, we are continuing to learn about computer hardware. We're going to talk about data storage, peripherals, and power protection. Data storage. Now, to talk about external data storage, which is storing files outside your computer to transport them somewhere else, let's take a little walk down memory lane. I'm going to start with the mighty floppy disk. Yes, I know there are older technologies like cassette tape drives. Yes, I had one of those. And even punch cards, if you're older than me. But when PC started to become popular, when most people started buying computers for home use, they came with floppy disk drives. Now, most computers sold today in 2023 don't come with floppy disk drives. In fact, you might not even have a CD or a DV drive in your computer. But you might come across some older PCs that still have them. They are still in use. Just 10 to 15 years ago, most computers still came with a three and a half inch floppy drive. Floppy disks only store about a couple of megabytes of data, so that's not a lot. And even those newer three and a half inch disks that are made of hard plastic, those are still called floppy disks, not hard disks. The hard disk is inside your computer, remember that. Right, this guy's got that hard plastic shell, so everyone thinks that's a hard disk. No, they're talking about the little floppy piece of magnetic film that's inside all of these disks. There's one inside here too, right? That's what's called the floppy disk. The case that it's in doesn't really make a difference, right? And also, make sure you keep these guys away from magnets too, okay? They're based on magnetic film, and if you get a magnet too close to them, you will erase them. In fact, they used to sell a bulk eraser that you could just erase all your disks in one shot. Now, because they don't have a lot of storage space, they can only really hold a couple of documents or a small program, maybe a couple of pictures. That's about it. I remember installing Windows 95 when it came on 13 floppy disks. Talk about a long install. You have to sit there and wait and wait and wait. Okay, insert disk two, and then you wait, and then you wait. <laughs> So even though floppy disks are an outdated storage medium, like I said, they've been around since the 70s. You'll be hard pressed to find one in the wild today, but you might still come across one, especially if you go over to grandma's house and she's got the old IBM PC in the closet, right? <laughs> okay, now after floppy disks, we started getting CD-ROM disks, which contained a lot more information, up to 650 megabytes. So that's hundreds of floppy disks would fit on one CD. And that allowed us to put Windows 95, for example, on just one CD. And everyone was amazed and things installed a lot faster. And that was great. Now, originally, CDs were read-only. You could only read information off them. They had to be professionally printed. 
at the CD printing company, right? You couldn't write data back to them. But then a few years after the CDs came out, we started getting rewritables where you could, at first you could write once to it. You could buy something called a CD burner. Once you burn data on the disc though, that was it. It was done. A few years later, we started getting rewritables where you can erase the disc and put more stuff on it. And then the same thing happened with DVDs and DVDs got even bigger, right? We could get up to 17 gigabytes. So billions of bytes of information on one disc at about the same size. And the same thing happened. First, they started off read only, and then you could erase them and write back to them once and blah, 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 blah. Now, most modern computers today that I've seen don't even come with a CD or DVD drive. Um, I did buy a laptop a couple of years ago that came with an external DVD player, just in case you had a DVD, you wanted to install something or watch a movie or whatever. Um, but most of the time now, it's an optional accessory. You will still see these, but a lot of times computers that are being sold, especially laptops, don't even come with them. So if you have DVDs or CDs at home that you need to be able to read and write, make sure your new computer does come with a drive for it. If not, you can get an external drive. Most of the shift away from built-in drives and even external drives is because of the prevalence of high-speed internet connectivity. With most computers now connected to the internet, transferring files electronically, streaming media, all that has become the norm, which basically gets rid of the need to store data on disks. But it's still good to have an understanding of what all these things are and where they came from and why they were important. If you do need to transfer files physically, today the most common form of external drive storage is the USB flash drive, also known as a thumb drive or a pen drive. These offer portability with various storage capacities ranging from a few gigabytes to several terabytes. They're plug and play devices, which means you just plug them into your computer in the USB drive port and they just work. You don't have to install any special software. These drives are fast. They're much faster than floppies or DVDs. Some of them will even work across multiple operating systems. They're ideal for file sharing, for backups, keeping your important files backed up so it's not just on your computer, right? You can carry important data wherever you go. Some models even include built-in security features like encryption or password protection. I've seen thumb drives with literal thumbprint readers on them. So you had to put your, your fingerprint on it for it to work. So all kinds of different things you can do with flash drives now. Now we're done walking down memory lane, fast forward to 2023, that's today. A lot of people, including myself, store their files on the cloud. Now cloud storage represents a revolutionary shift in how we manage and access our data. Unlike traditional physical storage devices, cloud storage allows us to securely store our files and information on remote servers accessible through the internet. With cloud storage, we are no longer bound by the limitations of local storage capacity. So you don't have to worry about filling up your hard drive. Instead, you just pay for more. We have virtually unlimited space to store and organize our photos, videos, documents, all that stuff. Cloud storage also gives you seamless access to your files from multiple devices. You could get your files from a computer, a smartphone, a tablet, mom's house, wherever you happen to be. Automatic synchronization ensures that changes made on one device reflect across all connected devices instantly. I personally love using Google Drive. So if I'm working on my office computer and I save some, some changes to a document, later on I could be on my phone somewhere else and, and open up that same exact document right on the cloud. Now, now this is something I hear a lot. The cloud doesn't represent some magical place out there in the internet someplace. Right? It's just simply someone else's computer where your files are being stored. Or in this case, it's a company's data center where you store your information. It's massive data server farms with lots and lots and lots of computers on them. There are three big players today. There's Google Drive, that's the one I use, Dropbox, and Microsoft's OneDrive. There are a lot of other companies too, like Amazon, IBM. I like the convenience of cloud storage, but always make sure you've got your critical files backed up on a trusted local device too, right? Even get yourself a thumb drive. They're cheap, right? Put all your important stuff on a thumb drive and put it in your safe, okay? Yes, I love cloud storage, but I would never rely on it 100%. Moving on to peripherals. Peripherals are any device that plug into the computer. For example, your monitor. 
This is your computer's screen. Now, back when I first recorded this class in 2002, CRT monitors were the norm. Cathode ray tube. Remember big old tube style TVs, right? And your grandma used to yell at you not to sit too close to it or you'd go blind. Anybody remember those? I had a couple of 21-inch CRT monitors on my desk when I was younger, and I thought I was the boss, right? <laughs> well, now again, flash forward to 2023, and you won't find those CRTs anywhere. Now it's all LCD monitors, liquid crystal display, or LED, right? Light-emitting diodes. They typically range in sizes from 22 to 24 inches. That's about the average for a business computer. You'll find ultra-wide gaming monitors, for people like me who would rather have one big monitor instead of four small ones like I used to have. And now, of course, a lot of big monitors are curved, which makes it easier to see the sides. Next up is the universally most hated peripheral in all of computerdom. The printer causes the most problems. There are three main types of printers commonly used today. You've got inkjet printers, which are generally the cheapest option. They can print both black and white and color. The cost per page tends to be higher due to the relatively expensive cost of ink cartridges. Laser printers, on the other hand, have a higher upfront cost to buy the machine, but the cost per page for printing is lower because the toner is cheaper. That makes them more economical for companies or families that do a lot of high volume printing. And finally, we have thermal printers, which are compact and portable, making them great for travel. However, they also require special paper with heat-sensitive coating for printing. So the cost per printing can be pretty high for those. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention dot matrix printers. Remember these guys? Yes, they still exist. You might come across them with companies that need to produce multi-part forms where you can print it out and sign it with carbon paper. Remember that stuff? My first printer was a dot matrix printer, and I'll never forget my mother waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning screaming at me because... It made that awful noise throughout the entire house when I printed off my homework for the next day. And of course, I had the English teacher who refused to accept printed homework because he didn't like the way that dot matrix printing looked. So I couldn't win. A lot of people, of course, have a love-hate relationship with printers. Why does it say paper jam when there is no paper jam? What is PC load letter? So yeah, love them or hate them. <laughs> Now, on the other side of printers, you got scanners, and scanners allow you to take the printed page and turn it into a digital file that you can store and work with on the computer. Now, in the past, standalone scanners were common, but nowadays you'll often find scanners integrated into printers, specifically inkjet printers. In fact, many modern smartphones have cameras that are high quality enough that you can effectively scan a page and send it directly to your email. This is what I do all the time. If you've only got one or two pages, like a receipt or an invoice that you want to save digitally, just take a picture of it with your smartphone. No need to buy a big scanner. However, if you do lots and lots of scanning, like 100-page documents, you can buy a sheet-fed scanner where you can put a whole stack of paper on it, and it'll just scan it through one page at a time and create a file out of it for you. So there you go. If you enjoy video conferencing, recording yourself, or creating content for platforms like YouTube, like I do, there's a wide range of video cameras, also known as webcams, available for your PC. You can find webcams that clip onto the back of your monitor, or ones on tripods for added flexibility. With the variety of options available, webcams can cater to diverse needs. Nowadays, most laptops come with a built-in webcam, and to address privacy concerns, many laptops have a small slider that allows you to cover the camera when not in use. For laptops without those built-in sliders, you can purchase a little webcam cover online. They provide a neat little effective privacy solution. I used to have a laptop that didn't have that, and I used to put a piece of tape on it. But they got little sliders you can get now. If you're into gaming, the world of joysticks offers an abundance of options. Whether you want to experience flying a plane, navigating a maze, or enjoying classic gaming like Pac-Man, there's a joystick designed for it. Remarkably, some manufacturers have even recreated the iconic Atari 2600-style joystick from the 70s. Remember that guy? This was my first joystick right here. <laughs> Other peripherals include speakers and microphones. While most laptops come with built-in speakers and microphones, for desktop systems, you may need to add them separately. There's a wide range of speaker options available from basic desktop speakers to premium ones like the Bose Super Bass Monster speakers. 
Headsets are popular, especially for late night gamers who don't want to wake up mom at 3 a.m. like I used to do. Headsets provide a private audio experience while enabling clear communication with teammates during gaming sessions or virtual meetings. For desktop recording purposes like my setup, you can use a dedicated microphone. I've got this guy right there, but I got a boom mic stand for it so I could put it off to the side, like next to my face while I'm recording. I actually did a whole set of videos on my YouTube channel to ask all my users which one they thought sounded the best, and that toner mic is the one that won, so yay. Another type of peripheral is the network adapter, which allows you to connect to your office network or the internet. You sometimes have the option of either a wired connection, which is commonly used in businesses, or a wireless connection on the home or office Wi-Fi. Wired connections generally offer faster speeds and better security, but with wireless connection, you have the freedom to move around without being tethered to a cable. Nowadays, most laptops come with built-in wireless networking capabilities. Higher-end laptops often have a wired network port, which is my preferred choice. For desktop PCs, you may need to acquire a network adapter, which can either be in the form of an expansion card that you plug in or a USB adapter that plugs into a USB port. Now, here's a blast from the past. <laughs> Some computers still have modems which is a device that lets you connect your computer to a telephone line. I'm just kidding with these two. This is, this is a joke. These are really old modems, and you probably will never see these again in your life. This one here is called an acoustic coupler, and you literally would take your phone, you'd dial the phone, and then you'd set it down on this thing, and it would connect to whoever you were connecting to, an, an, another computer or a, a bulletin board system or those things. Remember the movie War Games? That was a great... He had one of those. This little guy down here was my first actual modem. It was a 300 baud modem from Radio Shack for my TRS-80 color computer. This is what modems look like today, even if you even see one around. Um, some computers still use them. Modems were widely used in the past for dial-up internet access before broadband became uh, popular. Some computer systems still use these for sending faxes. So if you still send, I know a lot of medical offices and legal offices still send faxes. So 1990s, but it's, it, they're still used. And of course, there are services available online to where you can send and receive faxes without needing a modem. So it, it makes them completely moot. One essential aspect of computing that many people overlook is proper power protection for their computer. Now, when dealing with a desktop PC, Investing in a high-quality surge protector rated specifically for computers is crucial. Avoid using that cheap off-the-shelf power strip that you get from the hardware store. All right, they're not properly rated for surges to protect computers against power fluctuations, spikes, brownouts, that kind of stuff. Now, additionally, if you want to ensure data protection in the event of a power outage, I strongly recommend getting yourself an uninterruptible power supply or UPS. A UPS basically acts as a large battery that connects your computer to the wall outlet. So you plug your computer into the UPS, you plug your UPS into the power, and if the power goes out, or if there's a spike or any kind of brownout or whatever, the battery kicks in immediately and it continues to feed power to your computer. Depending on the size of your UPS, it can run your computer for anywhere from a few minutes to several hours. Essentially, it gives you time to save your work and shut the computer down properly in the case that the power goes out. I also use a UPS box like this on my TV at home because I live here in southwest Florida and all summer long we get thunderstorms and the power goes off for five seconds. So not only could that damage my TV, but it also shuts everything off and then the, you know, the TV's got to restart, the cable box has to reboot, all that stuff. So a UPS... They're not that expensive, and you can use them to protect all the expensive equipment in your house. Plus, you know, when I'm watching Star Trek, I, don't don't interrupt me, man. Just leave, just no. Just if the power goes out, I I, I lose it.
In lesson three, we're going to talk about using the keyboard. We'll learn about what all the different keys on the keyboard are and those little lights, and we'll learn how to use most of them. The keyboard, still the most popular way to get data into the computer, as far as I'm concerned. I use the keyboard a whole lot more than I use a mouse. I'm a keyboard guy. So let's talk about all the buttons on the keyboard. First, we have the alphanumeric and symbol keys. These are the most obvious keys on the keyboard, right? QWERTY, K-W-E-R-T-Y, all the numbers, all the little characters, the period, the slash, the backslash, all those things. Now, on a lot of larger keyboards, you'll often find this section over here on the right called the numeric keypad or the numpad. It's designed to give you a separate area where you can either type in numbers or you can use the little arrow keys to move up and down. It's designed to resemble the layout of a calculator and provides a convenient way to input numbers and perform mathematical calculations quickly. In fact, Windows even comes with a calculator app you can use. We'll talk about this guy in more detail in my Windows Beginner 1 class. The numpad is especially useful for tasks that involve extensive numeric data entry, such as accounting, data input, spreadsheet work, all that stuff. Now, not all keyboards have a dedicated numeric keypad. On smaller laptop keyboards, for example, the numeric keypad may be integrated into the main keyboard. Some users may also choose to purchase a separate external USB numeric keypad. The enter or return key is used to execute commands or actions, such as starting a new line in a document, submitting a form online, confirming a selection, all kinds of things. This is the enter key or the return key. If you are in a word processing program like Microsoft Word or this one, which is WordPad, it comes at Windows 11. If you are at the end of a document, for example, you can press the enter key to move down. See that? I'm moving the cursor down. We'll talk about the cursor in just a minute. This guy here is the space bar, one of the most fundamental and frequently used keys on the keyboard. It's typically the largest key and is centrally located on the bottom of the keyboard. It's got a very critical yet simple function to create a space between words or characters when typing. So as I'm typing here, right, Captain Space Kirk, space also rules, right? Now, for those of you who are old school and learn how to type on a typewriter back in school, we no longer put two spaces after a period or an exclamation point or any of that stuff, okay? Modern day fonts will give you a little bit of extra space between your sentences like that, so just one space. This guy on the keyboard is the backspace key and it erases characters to the left of the cursor. All right, so if I press the backspace key right now, it's erasing to the left, see that? And there's also a delete key that deletes to the right of the cursor. So if I take my mouse and move it in front of Kirk and click right there, okay? And if I hit the delete key, it deletes to the right of the cursor. That's the difference between backspace and delete. The tab key is used for indentation or to move between different fields on a form or a dialog box. The escape key is commonly used to cancel or close dialogs, pop up windows, or exit full screen modes. Here, for example, I got this pop up window and I don't know what I want to do with it. So I can either click cancel or I can hit escape on my keyboard and that will close most of those pop-up windows. A lot of larger keyboards will also have a separate set of keys that are arrows. And you can use those to navigate within documents, websites. You can use them to move the cursor or highlight items in different directions. On bigger keyboards, you got those. And on smaller keyboards, especially on laptops, you'll find the arrow keys integrated into the numeric keypad, as I mentioned earlier. Now to switch between the arrows or the numbers on the numeric keyboard, you press the numlock key. And a lot of keyboards will either have a special numlock light or the button itself will have a little light on it. A lot of laptops look like that. So I can use the arrow keys to go up, left, right, or down throughout my document. 
And if I press the numlock key, now the numeric keypad will put in numbers instead of those arrow keys, right? And I'll turn the numlocks back off and I'll backspace over those to get rid of them. There we go. Function keys, often labeled F1 to F12, are usually located in the top row of most computer keyboards. Each function key serves a specific purpose and their functionality can vary depending on the software or even the operating system you're using. For example, F1 is usually associated with the help function. When pressed, it opens up a context sensitive help menu, providing assistance and information related to the active application or whatever function you happen to be working on. F5 is widely used to refresh or reload the current page or document, especially in web browsers. It'll reload the web page. And again, the function keys may be assigned differently depending on whatever application you're working with. On laptop keyboards, the function keys often serve dual roles due to the limited space available. They might have special functions assigned to them in addition to their primary actions. To access those secondary functions, you sometimes need to hit a modifier key such as the FN or function key. When the function key is pressed in combination with the actual function key, it activates the secondary function associated with that key. This confuses a lot of people. The special functions may vary depending on the laptop model and manufacturer, but some common examples of the weird uses of function keys include brightness control. For example, you'd press the FN key in combination with F5 and F6 to increase or decrease the brightness of the screen. Other keys may control the laptop's volume, on-off condition of the wireless connection, and so on. Sometimes the FN key gives you the actual function key like F1, and sometimes it's mapped to that special secondary function key. It depends on the laptop manufacturer. You can sometimes switch that but it involves going into the computer settings, which is a little more advanced. And again, it's, it's different for each laptop. So I'm not gonna cover that today, but look in your laptop manual or consult your laptop's manufacturer. And I'm sure they'll give you instructions on how to do that. On most keyboards, you're gonna have three, maybe more modifier keys. The typical ones are Control, Alt, and Shift. You may have two sets of them, one on the left and one on the right side of the keyboard, or just one, depending on your computer. The shift key is used to type uppercase letters and the secondary functions of certain keys, such as typing symbols above the numbers. So if I press the letter A key, I get a lowercase a. If I hold down the shift key and press A, I get a capital A. Likewise, if I press the number one key, I get a one. If I hold down the shift key and press the number one, I get an exclamation point. See how that works? And there's that again. If you want an exclamation point, press and hold the shift key, press the key that has number one on it, and there's your exclamation point. Likewise, the control and alt keys work very similarly to the shift key. They're used in combination with other keys to execute shortcuts or perform specific tasks. For example, control and C is used to copy text to the Windows clipboard. And then control V is used to paste it. For example, here in my document again, I can select Star Trek with my mouse and then press Control C to copy that to the clipboard. And now if I come down here, I can now press Control V and it pastes it from the clipboard. That's copy and paste. And again, we'll talk a lot more about this in my Windows Beginner class. One special key combination is Control Alt Delete and it's also known as the Three Fingered Salute. Now, back in the old days, if you did control alt delete it just rebooted the computer back in the old DOS days, right? Nowadays, it's used to perform various system level functions. It brings up this screen where you can lock the computer, switch users, sign out, change your password, and so on. And again, I'm gonna go into this in a lot more detail in my Windows beginner class. Yes, folks, don't beat me up when I mention that I'm going to cover something in a future lesson. Right now, I'm just kind of introducing these topics. I can't cover everything all at once. People always say that, hey, you say that too much. You're going to cover this in a future lesson. Yeah, when we, when we get to this screen, we're going to cover it in more detail. That's how, that's how training works, right? 
The caps lock key toggles the keyboard between all uppercase letters and all lowercase letters. So when you toggle this, it toggles on and off. When it activates, all the letters you type in will be uppercase until you turn it back off again. Most keyboards have a little light that tells you if caps is on. Sometimes the light is on the key itself. So back in my document, if I put the caps lock on, if I type now without even holding down the shift key, everything is like I'm shouting, <laughs> right? In fact, I made a slide for this. Don't type in all caps online. <laughs> People will yell at you for shouting at them. So what I'll do now is I'll hit caps lock again, and now I'm back to lower case. Okay, see how that works? There's a special key that Microsoft introduced called the Windows key. And the Windows key is found on most modern computer keyboards, especially those designed for Windows. <laughs> you may have one or two of them depending on your keyboard. I think most modern keyboards only come with one. It looks like the little Windows logo, right? The little four pane window, whatever that is. It provides various shortcuts. For example, one of the primary functions of the Windows key is to open up the start menu that provides access to frequently used apps, settings, and files on your Windows computer. Windows key plus L, that means you hold down the Windows key and press, press the L key. That will lock the computer and switch back to the logon screen for security. So if you're getting up and going to grab a cup of coffee, go Windows key L and it'll lock your computer. I'm old school. I do the old thing, which is you press Control, Alt, Delete, and then Space Bar it does the same thing. I always forget to use Windows L. And there's tons and tons of other shortcut keys and tricks I'm going to teach you. And again, guess what? I'm going to cover those in future lessons in the Windows classes. Some older keyboards, you're going to see this thing called a right-click key. It's also known as the context menu key. It's not, you don't see it that, that many uh, on new computers. Um, it used to simulate a right-click from the mouse. But again, I haven't seen this on a computer in a long time now. Okay, some of the weird keys. There's a key called the insert key. Sometimes it's abbreviated INS. Its primary function is to control the way that text is inserted while typing. When you press the insert key, it toggles between two modes, insert and overtype. Now, insert mode is the default mode for most applications. New characters are inserted at the cursor position, the insertion point, and it pushes existing text to the right. When you turn off insert mode, you go into overtype mode, the text will be overwritten as you type, replacing the existing characters at the cursor position. So for example, I'm in my document. If I click right here, as I type, it pushes characters right. Okay, see how that works? Now, I'm gonna press the insert key. Now, as I type, it overwrites existing text. See how that works? That's the difference between insert and overtype. Do you want to replace what's there or just push it to the right? Now I'm going to turn the insert mode back on and now I'm back to normal. That's usually how word processors work. But it's another common question I get asked all the time. What does that insert key do? Well, now you know. On laptops and compact keyboards, you'll see that the insert key is either absent or integrated into, into other keys such as a secondary function key, like here's the scroll lock key. The end key is pretty much the opposite of the home key. It moves you to the end of a line of text or control end moves to the end of a document. All right, let's start here again. I'll click right there. If I hit the end key, I go to the end of the line. If I press control end, I go to the end of the document. Very handy if you're typing. Do you have to remember these? No, I'm just demonstrating them for now. We'll go over them again in the Windows classes. And if you take my Microsoft Word or Excel classes, we'll use those keys a lot too. The more I repeat them to you, the more likely you are to remember them as well. I don't remember all these shortcut keys myself. It took years and years for me to get a lot of these to stick, right? Sometimes I even look them up. A lot of keyboards will have a print screen button, sometimes abbreviated as PRTSC or PRTSCN. Now, back in the old days, this key used to send whatever text was on the screen directly to the printer because computers originally just used to be just lines of text. They didn't have images and graphics and pictures and stuff. 
Today, the print screen button serves a specific function related to capturing and saving the contents of the screen, but it doesn't send it right to the printer. It just saves it to the Windows clipboard. Now, this generally includes everything visible on the current screen, open windows, applications, the desktop itself, any active content. Now, normally the captured screenshot is not saved directly to a file, so it might appear that nothing happens. Instead, again, it's stored to the computer's clipboard. You can then open up another application like Paint or Word or whatever and paste that inside. The SysRQ key, short for System Request, is a key found on some computer keyboards, typically located right around or even on the print screen button. On most modern keyboards, you won't find a SysRec key anymore. It's been gone. <laughs> But once in a while, you'll still see one. I just looked around my office. I don't even have a SysRec key on any of my laptop keyboards. I've got an old desktop keyboard that's got one, though. Now, the SysRec key used to, it originated in the old days of computer systems when they used to be, it used to send specific low-level commands to the operating system. It could be used for diagnostics or debugging purposes. But, uh, yeah, if you see one of these today, just ignore it and and please just stop asking me what it does, everybody. Everyone always asks, what does this key do? I don't know. It doesn't work anymore. Just, just ignore it. Leave it alone. <laughs> just like the pause break key. All right. Now, again, back in the old days, when you used to execute a command, like a DOS level command at the, at the screen, you'd get, you'd get text that would just scroll by, sometimes too fast for you to read. So you could use the pause break key to pause the output of that text and allow you to read it. Now with modern systems, Windows 11, the pause break key really doesn't have a specific universal function anymore. Some applications do use it. Uh, pressing control pause break can sometimes pause or halt certain processes in a command prompt window. Uh, certain video games or media players will use it to pause music playback, for example. And I've seen some specialized accessibility functions that will use pause break. Um, or you can use it to launch certain macros or, or run other commands. But again, it doesn't have a specific purpose anymore. There's the scroll lock key, which again, you don't find on a lot of keyboards nowadays. The scroll lock key was originally used in early computer systems to control the scrolling behavior of text on the screen. When it was activated, it would lock the screen display, allowing you to navigate within the document or spreadsheet without changing the position of the cursor. So it would lock the document. You can scroll up or down. That's why they call it a scroll lock. But again, now with Windows 11, scroll lock almost isn't used anymore. Next up are page up, page down. And again, you might have dedicated page up and page down keys, or they could be integrated into your numeric keypad. Page up allows you to scroll up or move the content on the screen up one page. And page down moves... Um, down a page. <laughs> These are very handy in spreadsheet programs, word processors. You can use them online in a web browser. If you got a big document that goes up and down, like you know, a, a page that's multiple screens, you can use page up and page down instead of scrolling up and down with the scroll bar. And finally, some keyboards have special purpose buttons that are unique to that computer. There's a sleep button, a wake up button, a power button. Um, your laptop might have other different buttons that are specific to that particular computer. So be sure to check the documentation that came, came with your machine to find out more about what these do. So that's it. That's your ride through using the keyboard. In the next lesson, we're going to talk about using the mouse. In lesson four, we're going to talk about using the mouse. A computer mouse is a peripheral input device that is used to interact with the computer's graphical user interface. The mouse has been a fundamental input device for desktop and laptop computers since its invention back in the 1960s. Yeah, it's been around a while. It is a handheld device that typically consists of a small palm-sized body with one or more buttons and a scrolling wheel. The mouse is placed on a flat surface and its movement 
controls the movement of a pointer on the computer screen. When the user moves the mouse, the pointer follows the same direction and speed, allowing precise pointing and clicking on icons, buttons, and other elements. Holding your mouse. Properly holding a mouse is important to ensure comfortable and efficient use, especially during extended periods of computer work or gaming. Um, holding your mouse is as important as holding your chopsticks right. Right? If, you, if you're going to use the mouse right, you got to hold it. you got to grip it right. I like to hold the mouse with a relaxed and natural grip. Avoid gripping the mouse too tightly as this can lead to hand fatigue and discomfort. Allow your fingers to rest gently on the buttons and the scroll wheel. And yes, that is actually a picture of my hand on a mouse circa 2002. <laughs> now, there are two kinds of grips. There's the fingertip grip or the palm grip. I'm a fingertip guy. Choose the grip style that feels most comfortable for you. With the fingertip grip, only the fingertips touch the mouse buttons and the palm hovers above the mouse. This grip provides precise control and is well suited for small, lightweight mice. I like to put my thumb on the left side of the mouse, my index finger on the left mouse button, my ring finger on the right side of the mouse, and then your middle finger can go over the right mouse button, just like that little illustration shows right there. But of course, everyone's grip is different. With the palm grip, the entire hand rests on the mouse and the palm makes contact with the back of the mouse. This is better for larger ergonomic mice and provides more support for the hand. I personally don't like doing that. My palm never touches the mouse, but that's just me. Make sure you keep your wrist in a neutral position. Avoid excessive bending or angling of the wrist up or down. This can lead to wrist strain and discomfort. Put your wrist in a natural straight alignment with your forearm. Many people, including myself, like to use a wrist rest. Try saying that 10, 10 times fast. Wrist rest, wrist rest, wrist rest, wrist rest. Mm. Okay. Or purchase a mouse pad that has an integrated wrist rest. I got like a little gel one for mine. Trust me, I speak from experience. You don't want to get carpal tunnel from improper use of a mouse. I've been there. I used to finish working on a computer all day and then I'd go play video games with my kids. And so I'd spend, I don't know, 20 hours a day using a mouse and I might. My, my wrist was starting to hurt by the end of a couple of days of doing that. I also personally like to take a towel, just a regular bathroom towel, and I fold it up and put it under my forearm. So I've got the wrist rest, and then I got a towel behind that. So that's just for, for comfort. Now, as far as arm movement goes, I've read some experts recommend you use your arm and shoulder to move the mouse rather than just your wrist. I don't do this. They say it reduces strain on the wrist and helps to prevent, you know, the repetitive motion injuries. I, I've never done that myself. I just rest my forearm on my towel. I put my wrist on my wrist rest and I just use my wrist to move back and forth. That's all. But again, work with whatever works best for you. Now, we're going to talk about pointer versus cursor. And this is something that I've actually gotten in arguments with people over before. So I'm going to, I will die on this hill. Okay. The mouse pointer is often incorrectly referred to as the cursor. No, this is the pointer. It is a graphical icon displayed on the computer screen that indicates the position where actions such as clicking or selecting will occur while using the mouse. This guy right here, moving around right now, ooh, this little guy, that's the mouse pointer, okay? And it may change depending on what you move over. See that, how it changes sometimes? Okay, see, goes from an eye to a little four-way arrow, back to an arrow, same. It serves as a visual guide to help users interact with the computer. And a mouse pointer is usually a small arrow-shaped icon, but its appearance can vary depending on the context and the operating system. Older versions of Windows had this really grainy-looking guy. Newer ones look more like that. This is, see, that's the Windows 11 mouse pointer. And there's alternate themes. You can use a dark theme to get a dark one like that. In some cases, the mouse pointer may change to a hand icon when hovering over a clickable link, such as a hyperlink in a web browser. Or sometimes the pointer might change to a spinning circle or an hourglass when the computer is processing a task, making you wait. Again, waiting, always waiting. Oh, I hate waiting for the computer. Okay, so earlier I mentioned that the pointer is often incorrectly referred to as the cursor. The terms pointer and cursor are often used interchangeably and their meanings can vary slightly depending on the operating system and software being used. 
However, there is a slight, subtle difference between the two. The pointer is a term that refers to the icon the user can control and move on the computer screen using a pointing device like a mouse, trackpad, touchscreen, whatever. The cursor represents the active insertion point in a document which shows the location where text will be inserted when the user starts typing. The cursor is often a blinking vertical line or a vertical bar that appears within a text field, word processor, or any other application where text input is possible. It shows the user where the next character or text will be added or edited. For example, back to my WordPad document, okay? This is the mouse pointer. That blinking line at the end of the document right up here, right up here, that says Star Trek fans, see where it's blinking? That was blinking, blink. Sometimes if the, if the application loses the focus, if you click on something else, it stops blinking. But that's the cursor or the insertion point. So if I start typing now, that's where the text goes, at the cursor or the insertion point. This is not the cursor, this is the pointer. And you can point and click to move the cursor. See, point, click. It's one of my pet peeves when people use pointer and cursor when they shouldn't use, they should be the other one. Mm. <laughs> All right, so to point with a mouse refers to the action of moving the mouse to position the mouse pointer on a specific location or item on the screen. When you point with the mouse, you are using it to direct the pointer to a particular element on the screen. This doesn't include clicking. You just move the pointer. So for example, right now I'm just moving the mouse and I'm pointing at that B there, which says bold. I didn't click on it, I just moved the mouse pointer. That's called pointing. If I tell you to point at the find button, you come right up here and just point at it. Just sit right there, okay? Now clicking means to press one of the buttons on the mouse, usually the left button. If I say just to click on something, that is to click the left button. So you move the mouse, you get the mouse pointer positioned over a specific item, and to click the mouse, it sends a signal to the computer indicating you wanted to do something because you pointed at it and clicked on it. Clicking the mouse is used to select, activate, and interact with various elements such as icons, buttons, links, text fields, and more. Now in my classes, I'll always refer to clicking as meaning the left button. If I want you to click a different button like the right button, I'll say to right click. Okay, and clicking means to press the button down for a brief moment and then release it. Don't hold the button down and don't click on it multiple times. So again, if I come in here and I click on that B, I've now turned bold on. Now new text I type is in bold, see that? And I can click again to turn it off. Back to normal, see that? Here's a different WordPad document. I have my signature inserted into the document as a picture. If I hover my mouse over it and click on it, the picture gets selected. And then once it's selected, I can perform other actions on it, such as moving it or deleting it. Right, here's that document. I can move over that image, click, and now I've selected that item. I can then press delete on my keyboard to delete it, and it's gone. Right-clicking involves pressing the right mouse button while the mouse pointer is positioned over an item. Right-clicking typically opens a menu or provides a list of options relevant to whatever you've clicked on. For example, if I right-click on that image, it opens up a menu where it offers me options to cut, copy, paste, and do other stuff. And here it is. If I right-click on that guy, there's that menu, see? Now this one gets a lot of beginner users, the double-click. All right, double clicking involves pressing the left mouse button twice in rapid succession. You can't do it too fast or too slow. Finding the right rhythm sometimes takes a little while to master. When I used to teach this class in the actual classroom, getting the double click was something that took a lot of practice for some people who've never used computers before. In my WordPad document, if I double click a word, it selects that entire word, and then you can do stuff to that word. For example, I can then bold the word by clicking on the bold icon. Here's my document again. If I double click on the word captain, it selects that word. See, I can then click on bold. 
and it bolds that. I can double click on resolutions and underline it. Okay. But a lot of people have trouble. They either go too fast. See, I can't even do it wrong anymore. Or you go too slow. All right, I'm going click, click. That's not fast enough. But if you go too fast, sometimes you end up dragging, which you don't want to do. You can't move the mouse at all while you're double clicking. It's got to stay perfectly still. So this might take some practice, all right? Double click, double click. Once you do it for a while, you get the hang of it. Click and drag. To click and drag means to press and hold down the left mouse button, then move the mouse. This action is typically used to move an object on the screen. For example, in my WordPad document, I can click and drag the image of my signature and then move it to a different location. Here's my Word document again. I can click once to select my signature, right? That's an image. I can then click and drag by holding down the left mouse button and moving the mouse. And see that cursor moving? Wherever I let the button go, that's where it drops it. See that? Click, drag, and drop, just like that. And yes, if this is new to you, this will take some practice. You can also do it with words. I can come in here and select Wednesday by double clicking on it and then click and drag and move the word Wednesday. See that? Click and drag. You can also click and drag to select a large block of text. So far I just showed you double clicking to select a word. But if you want to select the whole line of text, you can click, start here, click, drag across, and that selects the whole line. And then you can Underline that if you want to, right? Or click and drag down to get multiple lines. You can also come over here in the margin, click and drag. And now all that text is selected. And again, I cover this in a lot more detail in my Windows classes and in my Microsoft Word class. Now, some mice might have a scroll wheel, which is a little wheel positioned between the left and right buttons. You can use this to move up and down a document, a web page, or something like that. Here I am in my web browser. This is my website. And if I use my mouse, I can use the scroll wheel on it to scroll down. See that? And it's scrolling down the page. All right, scroll back up. I can also use the page down and page up keys on my keyboard like we learned about in the last lesson. See that? I can also move over some text here to get a hyperlink. See that? I can click on it and load up that page then. And then to close my browser, I click on this little button up here with the mouse. And we'll talk about all these different things in the Windows classes. Now, some fancy mice might have more than two buttons. You could have a middle button. You could have a back button for your thumb on the left. That's especially useful on the web because you can then hit that instead of clicking on the back button in your browser. Some gaming mice will have all kinds of buttons over them to control the sensitivity of the mouse and you can use them to point and shoot and aim in your game, all kinds of things. Most mice don't have all these buttons, but some do. So if you bought a super cool, expensive, crazy gaming mouse, well, read the documentation that came with it. <laughs> Most mice today will have a left button, a right button, and a scroll wheel. Now, you might not have a mouse. You might have some other kind of a pointing device. For example, the trackball. Back in the day when I was trying to get rid of my carpal tunnel, I actually bought a couple of different trackballs to try. And a trackball is basically an upside down mouse. Instead of a ball on the bottom, it's got a ball on the top. If you're old like me, you might remember the video arcade game Centipede. It had a big ball in the middle and you move that around and you had to shoot the bugs coming down at you. Well, that's what this was. That was called a trackball. And nowadays, most laptops come equipped with something called a touchpad. It's a rectangular area that you slide your finger across and that moves the mouse pointer. Some touchpads have actual physical left and right buttons that you can click that simulate the left and right mouse clicks or you just tap the corner of it and without actually having a button there, that will tap the mouse buttons. And this specific feature depends entirely on what kind of laptop you have. And finally, a lot of modern computers don't even require pointing devices like a mouse or a track point because you simply tap on the screen with your finger. These are known as touchscreen devices and they're common in smartphones, tablets, and even PCs 
with touchscreen capabilities. All you need is your finger to control what happens on the device. Lesson five is something I call Rick's Tips. Now, I was going to call it Richard's Tips because I, I do go by Richard professionally, even though my friends and family call me Rick. You can call me Rick if you want. Um, but Rick's Tips sounded better than Richard's Tips. So we're going to go with Rick's Tips. Okay. We're going to talk about ergonomics, computer caveats, things you got to watch out for, and tips for noobs. Yes, new computer users are called noobs. It's a term of endearment. We don't mean any insult by it. And that's what we're going to talk about in lesson five. All right, ergonomics is the study of people's efficiency in their working environment. It involves designing or arranging workspaces, products, and systems so they fit the people who use them. Yes, this is kind of a dictionary definition, but if you don't know what ergonomics are, it's helpful. Ergonomics aims to improve workspaces and environments to minimize risk of injury or harm and enhance productivity by focusing on factors like comfort, ease of use, and the physical and psychological impact of design choices. That's a pretty cool definition, huh? This can include aspects such as chair height, keyboard positioning, workspace layout, and even the design of tools and machinery. Here are some of my tips from my extensive experience using computers. First, position your monitor so the top of it is at or near your eye level. You don't want to strain your neck by constantly looking up at your screen but also you should avoid staring down excessively too. Keep your monitor about an arm's length away. It shouldn't be too close to your face or too far. And of course, adjust as needed based on your vision. And of course, posture is important. I try to keep my, my monitor, the top of my monitor, right at the top of my eye level. I've got two monitors on my desk. I got a big monitor across the top and I've got my laptop which sits below that. And I, I have found that if I start to slouch in my chair at all, then I have to look up at the screen. So that, that's my way of catching my posture. So it forces me to keep my posture up, keep your back up straight, right? That way you don't have to worry about slouching or, or looking up and down. And it, it's kind of like when you go to the theater and you sit in the front row, right? And you got to look way up at the screen, okay? Speaking of vision, something very important to me. Be sure to take eye breaks, Right. Do little eye exercises. Stop working. Look out the window. Look at something across the street, a car, a house, whatever. And then look at something close like your hand. Right. Do that back and forth like 10, 15 times. I try to do this at least once an hour. It prevents your eyes from getting locked in like a fixed position for too long. Right. It's good for your overall eye health and to prevent vision related headaches. I used to get them all the time. And of course, it goes without saying I shouldn't even have to put it in this video. Make sure you got proper eyeglasses if you need a prescription eyewear. I've mentioned this before, get wrist rests for both your mouse and your keyboard. You'll thank me later. I also recommend getting a foot rest for beneath your desk. Now, occasionally I like to have my feet flat on the floor, but after a while, I like to sit back and elevate my feet, especially when I'm doing something that's not super important. Now, I've tried various commercial footrests, but honestly, what I find works the best is my lockbox. I got one of those little fireproof safe boxes, right? There's nothing in it, but it's the perfect height to sit under my desk for me to put my feet up on. So whatever works for you, it's like four or five inches tall and it works great. All right. So figure out something that works for you. There's a lot of these different commercial footrests on like Amazon and stuff. You can try those. I've tried a couple of them. I wasn't happy with any of them. And I went back to my, my little lockbox. <laughs> now, here's a suggestion I have for those with the necessary budget. I truly love my standing desk. It's a desk that you can adjust. It's got a little electric motor. So it's either at sitting height or you can lift it up to be at standing height. You push a single button, it goes up. You can stand when you're working. You push another button, it goes back down to your seated height. Now, they're not super expensive. I paid like $500 for mine. But when I have a long day in the chair, you know, and I've got stuff I've got to get done, I push the button, I stand up. I've got one of those uh, kitchen uh, floor mats that have like the gel in it so I can stand on that with my socks. It's so comfortable. 
right? I don't use it super often, maybe once a week or so, but it's fantastic for those moments when I, I got to work and it's a real backsaver if I don't want to sit in my chair all the time. So check it out. All right, next up, computer caveats, things you need to watch out for, be careful of. First off, keep beverages away from your computer. I've ruined numerous keyboards and even complete laptops in the past because of spilt drinks. In fact, my lab puppy wrecked a $1,000 laptop when he got excited and knocked over my coffee that was sitting next to the laptop. Now, if it's just water that you spill, yeah, usually if you unplug it right away, turn it off, you can save it. But no, not with coffee. It's because I have cream and sugar in mine. It's all sticky. It gets inside the keys. It was it was gone. I no, I wasn't gonna about to take the whole thing apart and try to clean it. Um, so now what I do is I have a little drink holder that sits below the surface of my desk. So it's almost impossible for me to spill a drink on my desk now. And even if my puppy does come in, he can he can't knock that. If he knocks it over, it's just gonna fall on the on the ground. So be careful. I mentioned this one earlier in the hardware lessons, but magnets and computers are not friends. Now, chances are if you got a brand new computer, you don't even have any magnetic parts in it, but just in the case you've got an old school hard drive, don't put any magnets near your computer. I'm talking about magnetic tipped screwdrivers. I'm talking about magnetic decals. I had one customer that had her, her like a magnetic, like a, a little calendar that she got from a company and it was stuck to the side of her computer and she kept having problems and couldn't figure out why it was right up against where the hard drive was and it was just strong enough to cause problems got rid of that thing problems went away laser printers and power all right large laser printers and copiers draw significant amounts of power when they first start up or when a print job is sent to them they go into sleep mode you send out a print job it kicks on so don't plug your laser printer into the same power strip or even wall outlet that your computer's on because the printer can drain power, taking it from your computer, causing your computer to reboot or lose power momentarily or all kinds of strange problems can happen. So if you have a large laser printer, place it across the room from your computer or at least run an extension cord to a different outlet. And of course, I strongly recommend you plug your computer into a quality surge suppressor or UPS. Next up, keep your PC off the floor. I've seen so many offices, especially where they've got their computer on the floor. No, don't do that. Don't do that. Keeping it off the floor keeps it safe from spills, kicks from your feet, passers-by, other things like that. Additionally, raising the computer off the floor can help prevent dust and debris from getting sucked into the system, which can clog fans and other components, leading to overheating and potential damage. If possible, place your PC on a dedicated stand or a stable surface to maintain good airflow and accessibility. Yes, there are desk mounted brackets like this guy or little roller stands you can get that can keep your PC elevated off the floor, even just a couple inches. And these accessories not only protect the computer from potential damage, but also provide ease of access and can help in maintaining proper ventilation. Very important for a computer, airflow. Speaking of dust, I've seen stuff worse than this, okay? Dust is a silent killer for your computer, and I recommend that if you have a traditional desktop or tower case, that you have it professionally cleaned out at least once every couple of years. Or if you know how to open up the computer yourself, get yourself a can of compressed air, take it outside or to the garage, blow the dust out of it. If this is not something you feel comfortable doing, a lot of PC repair shops will do it for you for a relatively small fee. And trust me, it's better to pay the small fee to have the dust blown out of the fans in your computer and the power supply than it is to have them stop working and your CPU dies, and then you're looking for a new computer. And of course, make sure the computer is off and unplugged before you try opening the case. And I don't recommend you do this unless you are fairly knowledgeable and experienced with working on things like this. I'm not telling you to do this. I'm just saying if you are the kind of person that goes inside your computer, then blow the dust off the fans once in a while. And remember, don't open the power supply. And don't do that funny thing where you turn the can of air upside down and it blows frost out of it. No, that's that don't do that. That's bad. <laughs> yeah, back in the 90s when I had my computer repair shop, we used to chase each other around the office like pretending we were frost-breathing dragons. No, don't do that. It's not safe. 
Here's another one from the, the tales of my computer repair days. Don't use power strip buttons to turn your computers on and off. I had a customer once who did this because he had a computer, the monitor, the speakers, the printer, everything plugged into one power strip. So when he left for the day, he would just hit that power button and turn everything off and come back in the next day and hit the power switch and turn everything back on. Now, this is going back to the days when you know, even direct power like that from a power strip would still turn a computer on. Nowadays, most computer switches don't. You have to still physically hit the switch on the computer to turn the computer on, but you could turn it off by killing the power from the power switch, from the, from the power strip. Not a good idea. Don't do that. First of all, you can leave a computer running 24-7. They don't use that much power. But if you're going to turn the computer off, Windows likes to be shut down using the Windows shutdown commands on the start menu. Yes, we'll talk about that in our Windows class. It's also not a good idea to have all of your equipment like that on the same power strip as I mentioned earlier, especially if you got a printer on that power strip, okay? So turn off and on all the components individually. Also, beware of static electricity. Now, I've known more than a couple of computers who have shocked their computers to death, literally. And if you work in one of those places that's filled with static electricity, or if you have your computer in a house with lots of rugs. I remember my days, I used to live up in Buffalo, New York for most of my life. And in the winter especially, you get that dry heat going on, middle of January. You know, you get up, you walk to the bathroom, you come back, you, you know, you've walked across two carpets by now. You know, you, you touch a door handle and zzz, zap, right? Now, that kind of a static charge can actually kill a computer. I've seen it happen before, okay? So, try to discharge the static from your body before you touch your keyboard or mouse. Touch the bottom of your desk if there's metal there. Touch, like I said, touch a doorknob if you can. Discharge. Better to zap your finger than to zap your computer. Those things are really sensitive. Now, if you do work in, a, in an environment where you've got lots and lots of static and there's nothing you can do about it, they do make these strips that you can put. You can attach the strip to your keyboard and then it clips to something metal like under your desk and you can touch that before you touch your keyboard to, to discharge the static. They, they use these in PC repair shops a lot. All right, I talked about this earlier. Buy a UPS. They're not, you can get them one for under 100 bucks now. They're not expensive. And if the power goes off for even a few seconds, you, you, you might lose a lot of work and you could damage your computer. Even if you're working with a laptop, like I work with a laptop all the time. I still, even though the laptop has a battery in it, right? If the power goes out, the laptop still stays on, but the UPS still gives me even more time to be able to shut everything down and, and it, it protects me from spikes and surges and make sure that my laptop is safe. All right, tips for noobs. This is for beginners. Noob is a term of endearment. I love noobs, okay? First of all, mistakes won't kill you. Well, probably. <laughs> a lot of people are afraid to use their computer because they're afraid they're going to break something. Don't worry. Generally, the computer is going to warn you before you can do something that's going to break it. All right? Usually, it'll say, are you sure you want to do this? If it says, are you sure, and you're not sure, say no or hit cancel. All right? There's a feature called undo in a lot of applications, Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint. They've all got an undo feature. If you click on something, if you, if you delete something and you're not sure, just undo it. And again, I'll talk more about undo in my Windows classes. Be persistent. The only way to really learn how to use the computer is to use the computer, right? Try and try again. I can show you how to do these things. I can tell you about stuff. But if you're not persistent, if you don't practice, you're not going to go very far. Right, it's like becoming a baseball pitcher. You just got to do a lot of pitching, right? You just got to use your computer. You'll get better at it. I've had people from all ages take my classes from six years old to 80 years old. So everybody can learn this stuff. Make sure that you apply what you learn. Again, you'll only learn so much from watching my hour long video. Okay. You got to practice and apply what you learn. Do these things, practice, practice, practice. This class was mostly informational. But my other classes, like when I'm teaching Word and Excel and that kind of stuff, you got to just do it. You got to practice it. Don't be afraid to explore. Click on things. Be curious. If you want to know what a button does, go ahead and click on it. Chances are you're not going to break something. Chances are. <laughs> Before you can do something catastrophic, the computer usually will ask, are you sure? And if you're not sure, well, say no. 
But more importantly also is to don't try to learn too fast. Right? I get people that want to buy like, you know, my entire expert series of classes and go through it in a weekend. No, take your time. I usually recommend don't spend any more than a couple hours a day trying to learn a new topic, any topic. After that, take a break, take a break, right? Rest, rest your brain, sleep on it, come back the next day. Walk away if you get frustrated. Banging your head against the keyboard isn't going to help, right? Get a cup of coffee, take a walk, do your eye exercises, and then come back when you're refreshed. And in fact, one of the things I teach a lot when I'm teaching Excel or Microsoft Access, which is database stuff, is apply what you're learning to non-work topics, okay? Um, if all you're doing is applying your new computer skills for work, you're not going to find it very much fun unless you love your job. Um, when I started learning computers, I used to collect baseball cards. So one of the first things that I did was I built a database to store and track my baseball cards. So I applied my computer knowledge that I was learning to something fun. That was a hobby. that was enjoyable. All right. If it's fun, you're going to want to do it over and over again. So try to apply what you're learning with the computer to having some fun, play some games, do something enjoyable. Now, when it comes to what to learn next, you've just finished Intro to PCs, so congratulations. Next, I would recommend my Windows beginner classes. I usually have multiple levels of each type of class, so I've got Windows, Word, Excel, whatever. I would go to Windows next and at least take the first one of those. Then, if you're planning on learning Word and Excel, which are the two most popular programs that I teach, Microsoft Word, I would learn first, and then after that, go into Excel. And then after that, go into whatever other topics you want to learn, like Microsoft PowerPoint or Publisher or Access, if you want to learn how to build databases, all that kind of stuff. But that is the order in which I would learn stuff next. So there you go. Congratulations. You just finished Introduction to Personal Computers. Give yourself a round of applause. Now, if you're watching this video on YouTube and you enjoyed it, please give me a thumbs up and be sure to share it with your friends, family, and coworkers. Also, be sure to subscribe to my channel, which is completely free. Click the bell icon and select all to receive notifications when I post new videos. What class is next? What should you look for next in the series? Well, I recommend next you take my Windows Beginner Level 1 class. Today's class focused mostly on hardware and terminology. My Windows Level 1 class centers on using the Windows operating system and the software that comes with it. Just like Intro to PCs, the class you just finished watching, Windows Beginner 1 is another free class. You can find it on YouTube. You can also find it on my website at the link shown or just do a search for Windows Learning Zone. I've got a different learning zone for each of the topics that I teach. I've got Word Learning Zone, Excel Learning Zone, Access Learning Zone, which is my popular one. Today was basic computer stuff, so it's Computer Learning Zone. It all falls under the same family. On my website, you'll find an extensive area of lessons on various subjects, including Windows, Word, Excel, my personal specialty, Microsoft Access, and lots more. I've got dozens of hours of absolutely free lessons available. Most of my level one classes for every topic are free. It's a valuable resource you don't want to miss. Explore the content and enhance your skills today. Once again, if you have any questions regarding the material covered in today's class and you're watching this course on my website, just scroll down to the bottom of the page you're on and post your questions there. I've got a great group of moderators who love answering questions from students just like you. Now, the only way I can make my classes better in the future is with your feedback. So if you have a few free moments, I kindly invite you to visit my website and participate in a brief survey. Your honest feedback and insights are highly valued and will contribute to enhancing the learning experience for future students. Also, be sure to check out my Tech Help series of videos. These videos are primarily focused on answering specific questions sent in by my students. Whether it's about Microsoft Word or Windows or Excel, I do my best to provide detailed solutions and demonstrations. And also, if you have any questions, feel free to submit them. If I like your question, I'll make a video out of it.
Thank you for watching this video from Computer Learning Zone. Again, my name is Richard Rost. I hope you learned something today. Live long and prosper, and I'll see you next time.